Have you ever wondered if there was some crazy stuff hiding in the G.I. Joe comics? Well, it turns out there was. So let's take a look. <laughs> G'day everyone, welcome back to Frostbite's G.I. Joe Repro. So, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of these uh, research type videos recently and and listing things that I've found um, and it's been really great for me because, uh, you know, I research one thing and something else falls out of that and then I just chase the bouncing ball. Um, so, yeah, I've been having a fantastic time checking out all this content. Um, and then making stuff for you guys. So I hope you've been appreciating it um, or finding it interesting or helpful because, uh, you know, that's what keeps me going, making this stuff for you guys. Um, but anyway, today uh, we're going to look at 50 uh, facts or tidbits or cool things that I found from the original Real American Hero um, vintage comics line. So one to one five five. Um, found managed to find fifty things that I thought were cool, uh, and yeah, thought I'd just share it with you. So we're going to go through one by one. Um, let me know in the comments if you think any of these weren't interesting. Uh, there's probably a few of them that a lot of people knew about. Um, there were certainly a lot of these that I wasn't aware of. And, and therefore it was worth me mentioning just in case there's people like me. Um, and, and while I'm at that, I'd really like to thank people that have been leaving comments on my recent videos saying, you know, um, this video really helped. Uh, I didn't know about that. Um, or even the people um, uh, that, you know, I've gotten something wrong and, They've let me know what it was and I've gone away and checked and yeah, you've been right. So I've been still learning even from the comments. So that's been fantastic. Just keep that up and uh, I'll keep cracking on with videos. All right. So uh, let's, uh, let's keep going with this. Um, number one. So, uh, and if you haven't checked it out recently, <laughs> Like I said, content just keeps falling from content. Um, so in my research for this, I come across uh, this 1998 uh, interview that Larry Harmer did with um, Tom Root from Toy Fair magazine. Excellent interview. Go check out my video. Um, yeah, I, I learned a few things from that as well. Um, but... In this interview from Toy Fair magazine, Larry Harmer revealed that the original line uh, for G.I. Joe was, our job is to do the unthinkable and then be forgotten. So apparently editor at the time, Tom DeFalco, changed the line during the editing process and in so doing, redefined Hawke's entire leadership style. Uh, found that super interesting. I mean, that's what an editor's job is, right? Is to get in there and, and make things right in his opinion. Um, but who knows what could have been if we had have kept that original line. So, yeah. Uh, fact number two. So in, in G.I. Joe number two, Stalker in one panel. Um, and as you can see on the slide there, refers to Quinn as Nanook. And that was actually a reference to the 1922 film, Nanook of the North. Um, yeah. Uh, fact number three, on the cover of G.I. Joe number four, so the one you can see up on the slide right now, uh, the soldier leading the team is unknown and does not actually appear in the issue. Uh, so, you know, the, the guy in charge of the cover art of the time just thought, we'll have this, um, you know, courageous looking guy. We'll have two of our best Joes or even three. So you've got Scarlet, Snake Eyes and Stalker. 
following this rando guy. So pretty funny, I thought. Um, next up, and, and probably a lot of people will know this, uh, before Destro was officially named, he was known as the specialist. Um, so they were calling him the specialist for quite a few comics. Um, and then eventually got around to naming him officially in one of the comics. Next up in GI Joe number seven, which you can see on the slide, uh, there are two Cobra characters. Uh, the two commandos left behind to execute the Joes and the October Guard, and they refer to each other as Rattler and Copperhead. Um, and they're both names that obviously would be reused later, one for a vehicle and one for um, an actual character. So you can see up, it's in the little cartoon panel there. It says, everyone else, mount up. We depart for the stronghold. Shall we get started, Rattler? Not yet, Copperhead. I want to watch them sweat for a little while. That would indicate to me that uh, there was intent to, uh, like the Joes, actually have a lot more uh, code names for the Cobra members instead of being just generic uh, troop builders. And then, obviously, they just sort of didn't like that idea. And, uh, and just went about having generic troops. Uh, Copperhead they kept and, and Rattler they obviously reused. Uh, in G.I. Joe number seven again, when Stalker sees the hallway full of King Cobras, he says Cobra must have stolen the idea from Steven Spielberg. Um, and clearly this is a reference to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, you can see in the cartoon panel, he's saying, I hear a hissing sound stalker. Could it be gas? Uh, that's too pedestrian for Cobra's taste. And yeah, you can see all the snakes then. So yeah, sweet reference to a, an excellent movie. Next up uh, in G.I. Joe number eight. Um, so I found this interesting that it was the first issue that wasn't written by Larry Harmer. So he got seven issues out. Um, it was obviously doing not too bad, the comic series. And then for some reason that we don't know of, or I don't know of, let me know in the comments if you do, uh, number eight wasn't written by him. Found this interesting, a nice close-up of, uh, of Cobra Commander. Uh, we found out he's got blue eyes. So, you know, for um, when you don't know much about a character, you know, their face is always covered um, and you don't know their history and, and you know, it comes down to knowing little things like having intelligence on, uh, on a person or a character. Uh, just knowing their blue eyes is, is a bit of a cool thing. Um, and check out this... Cobra Trooper in the background who thought he was just going to cop it. Uh, but yeah, Cobra Commander is obviously happy with the news that he's delivered. Uh, okay, next up. So G.I. Joe number one and 11 were the first two Joe comics advertised using television commercials. Um, and what a, you know, just a great thing to do. Um, I don't, I hadn't, I, I didn't know this fact. Um, I didn't know that uh, Marvel were actually using TV commercials to advertise their comics. And so I went and checked a couple out on YouTube and yeah, it's fantastic how they did it. Um, we just don't see it. Like I don't, I've never seen a TV advert for a comic. Um, so yeah, this was a really cool fact. Uh, next up, G.I. Joe number 14 was the first time that we saw a logo for the Cobra Air Service. Um, check out those logos on the helmets. Uh, they're a bit of a, a move from what we have these days, uh, but still very cool. And um, 
Now, I know we have different ones these days, but, uh, you know, that that is something that could be used for Cobra Paratroopers, uh, just a specified logo for them. Thought it was cool, especially with uh, all the talk of the patches coming with the, the Rattler. Um, yeah, just to find out where the roots came from for uh, today's logo. It was it was cool. Um, okay, in GI Joe number seventeen, there is an implication that Snake Eyes laughs at a gambler's comment. This caused readers at the time to ride into Marvel and complain that Snake Eyes shouldn't be able to laugh since he is mute. They are actually incorrect, as it is possible for a mute person to laugh. Um, as they aren't using, well, they aren't using the vocal cords that someone requires to talk. They don't, they're not using those to laugh. Um, found that super interesting. Uh, you can see, you know, there's obviously a bit of a joke that, um, old mate has to roll a snake eyes, uh, and while he's rolling the dice, other guy comes back and says, you know, what's so funny? So, yeah, I think anything that, um, and you got to remember, this was the 80s at the time. No one's doing what I did when I saw this and just look it up on Google and go, can mute people laugh? Um, so, yeah, a lot of people just probably took the natural assumption they couldn't laugh and then got on their riding high horse and, and sent actual letters in. Uh, to tell Marvel they were wrong. Okay, next up, and I loved this, uh, in G.I. Joe issue number 18. It's the first and only issue in this vintage line, the 1 to 155, that features the Manta vehicle. Um, so, yeah, cool fact. But then the next one was excellent. Uh, so I think I did another. Yeah, I did. Uh, so the manor's appearance in number 18 weirdly featured foot pegs in the art, just like the original toy would have. And you can see them here. Just so odd. When have we ever seen a vehicle in a comic that shows foot pegs for the figures to stand on. Loved it. It's, um, we'll see how we go. But yeah, this could have been my favorite uh, fact to find out about the, the ARAH comics. Um, okay. In G.I. Joe 19. Uh, the next issue box at the end promises an unusual tale by Larry Harmer. And obviously that was a reference to the famous silent interlude. Um, but that was pushed back one month for some reason. And issue 20 wasn't written by Larry Harmer at all. So just it, it shows you, uh, you know, how quickly things were, were getting done back in that time that they wrote this at the end of the comic and then... Uh, something happened, and Silent Inlude obviously become number 21 in the series. Um, and then that 20, yeah, something happened there. Um, also in number 19, we see the deaths of General Flag, Scarface, Quinn, and Dr. Venom, as I covered in my uh, G.I. Joe deaths video. So, and I hadn't thought about it when I did that video, but this actually, all these deaths represent every sig significant character appearing in that comic who wasn't in the toy line at the time, dying all at once. Uh, it, you know, we knew it was a very kill, a very big kill off of characters at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't actually link that back to, there were no toys for those guys. So let's just kill them off. It was very weird. Um, and then, so for the 16th fact, um, the, and, and I sort of saw this at the time when I was doing that GI Joe deaths video, 
I saw the image up in the top left and I thought, that's weird. I don't know who that is. Uh, it was the helmet that sort of freaked me out because I thought oh, it's probably Lady J, but I didn't know. Um, but it turns out uh, image of the top left Marvel box of the issue is uh, of the fill-in editor Linda Grant in an army hel uh, helmet. Um, so, yeah, very cool. Very personalized down to that person who was the fill-in editor. Um, so it turns out um, that all the Marvel comics that month were part of Assistant Editors Month and most had light comical stories. Um, G.I. Joe bucked this trend going all out for conclusion and first major storyline. Um, and as I mentioned in my deaths video, this was a really hard, very hard uh, sort of comic box um, to see. So many deaths in that issue. And then, you know, the handing over of Quinn's necklace and general flags, dog tags was, you know, real, real stab to the heart of uh, just hit you right in the feelings. Um, and considering that every other Marvel comic was just having a nice light story that month and G.I. Joe just went, bam, take that. Um, yeah, it was, it was a very cool thing. Um, so next up, up to but including issue number 19, Marvel had now featured every character and piece of equipment from the first two years of the Real American Hero toys, except for the flak. So up to number 19, we saw every toy, uh, vehicle character, everything of the first two years of the toys, except for that flak. So yeah, I thought that was pretty cool as well um, because we have discussed, you know, um, using those how the characters were used in the comics to advertise the toy line but yeah clearly they they achieved their aims with that um okay next up so in issue 21 which is the silent interlude that was apparently supposed to be number 20 uh snake guys throwing the grenade at one of the red ninjas is an homage to indiana jones fight with cairo swordsman in raiders of the lost ark um, and it's a great little panel to look at. You know, you've got this ninja coming up with his size and he's like, bam, I've got size, bro. And then Snake Eyes is like, eat a grenade, bro. Um, yeah, very cool. Well done. Um, in issue 26, Stan Lee is flying the helicopter with an unknown co-pilot named Hogan. Um, so you can see it there. Uh, we've got Stanley here, uh, stalker. And then this guy here, um, you see him a couple of panels earlier. He's got a, a name tag that says Hogan. He's a very freckly faced dude. Looks like a kid. Um, you know, I did. I did, I must have done like an hour's worth of research just to find this guy and who it might be. Um, and I came up with nothing. It was, uh, it, it seems to be a very well-kept secret. Um, so definitely let me know in the comments if you know who it is. I mean, I searched for, um, you know, uh, people working at Marvel at the time. I searched whether Stan Lee was good mates with um, anyone named Hogan. I did find that Stan Lee was an avid helicopter pilot at the time um, and most of his life. So that really makes sense that he's been put into this uh, picture frame uh, as flying the helicopter. Um, but yeah, this Hogan guy, I have no idea. Um, let me know if you know, because you'll be helping both of us out. 
Um, okay. So in issue 27, uh, Kid refers to Storm Shadow as Moon Knight. So Storm Shadow is running through the streets, is getting chased by the Joes. And yeah, this rando kid's just like, it's Moon Knight. Thought that was very cool. A bit of a shout out to one of its uh, other white dressed characters. Uh, next up, issue 28. Um, Doc heads out in the Dragonfly with Wild Bill. However, he's in the gunner seat, which according to him in issue 11, is illegal by the Geneva Convention to fire a weapon. Um, so, yeah, not the first time we've sort of seen Doc talk about Geneva Convention. And, um, yeah, it was just odd to see. It's, it was obviously um, one of the illustrators and the writers just had a bit of a brain fart and forgot about their whole thing with the Geneva Convention. But, yeah, whatevs. Next up, issue 36. Uh, so this was interesting, I thought. Uh, Statue of Liberty was undergoing renovations at the time that the comic was released. So that's why the, uh, in the comic you can see scaffolding all around Statue of Liberty. They could have easily just drawn the Statue of Liberty, but to uh, put the scaffolding up that was apparently there at the time, uh, just a fantastic little touch in time moment. Uh, issue number 39. So we see these guys, they need to cross a river. It's a raging torrent. Um, and they decide to, to build the two rope bridge. Um, so in an interview with Toy Fair magazine, Larry Harmer cited as one of his influences for writing G.I. Joe, uh, this, this story in particular was a story from Walt Disney Comics and Stories number 181 in which Donald Duck's nephews Huey, Dewey and Louie enter a bridge building competition. Um, so this issue apparently in which the Joes build a bridge over an impassable river owes a lot to that story. Uh, I found that fantastic that we're referencing Huey, Dewey and Louie for uh, G.I. Joe, but yeah, it works. And Larry Harmer is apparently coming out and saying that. Um, and then sort of to, to keep on that run, uh, in issue number 42, the Springfield police officers' names are Huey, Louie and Dewey, um, obviously after Donald Duck's nephews. And they just blatantly come out with it all in one uh comic panel it cracked me up all right in issue number 43 one of the letter writers on the post box the pit page expresses his thanks that the ideas aren't too corny like making cobra commander turn into a snake um so this guy's probably maybe not around right now but could be um but can you imagine his surprise? He's gone to the lengths of writing that excellent letter and then the G.I. Joe movie comes out. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty funny statements, you know. All right. In issue number 43, again, uh, it also confirmed, the letters page also confirms that Larry Harmer appeared on an episode of MASH and the Martin Sheen episode of Saturday Night Live. So uh, you may be looking at this and goes, yeah, bro, everyone knows he was in MASH. Uh, I didn't know he was on Saturday Night Live. And you got to think back at the time, no internet to go and check his appearances. So having this confirmed in, uh, you know, in the comic itself, this was actual information. This is where people got their information sometimes. So, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, in issue number 45, so it was printed in 1986 uh, in the post box of Pitt Letters page. The editor responds to one letter by saying a well-known filmmaker has the option on the live action rights to G.I. Joe. 
So that movie was obviously never made, um, and we wouldn't see anything until 2009. Uh, so it also announces that the um, that rather than a third animated miniseries, G.I. Joe will become an ongoing syndicated show. Uh, so, yeah, we didn't see any of that for a very long time. Uh, being the G.I. Joe movie, obviously. So they've just sat on these uh, live action rights for like this long, just probably selling them back and forth around Hollywood. Okay. Issue number 49. Um, we actually saw the first use in a comic of the Yo Jo battle cry from the cartoons. So 49 issues into the series, and that's the first time we see Yojo. Um, and a bit later on as well, they actually yell out Yo Hawk because uh, Hawk was giving them orders. So that was pretty funny. Issue number 50, uh, the mascot at Springfield High School is the Vipers. And you can see it um, on the signs in there, Go Vipers. I mean, it all makes sense, but yeah, it's just cool to see. A lot of these facts uh, was, uh, you know, sort of split down into uh, being cool. Just didn't know, but still okay. Um, and I really want to tell other people about this. So if you're seeing ones like this, that yeah, the, the mascot of the team is the Vipers. Yes, it does make sense. Um, but it's just cool and, yeah, good to share. In issue number 58, uh, Mainframe provides a realistic explanation for how a computer modem works. So this was years before um, most of the audience reading G.I. Joe had even heard of a modem before. Um, so I sort of I really like this because it was just um, – it's – like, we always knew that Larry Harmer and, and the guys behind the Joe comics really took a lot of their time to research things and and um, almost explain it, explain stuff to us in uh, the comics as well. And this was just one of those just great um, examples. So, yeah, great. Um, next up, in issue number 59, Tunnel Rat, uh, when he refers to having, you know, he's got his pay, um, he pulls out a G.I. Joe credit card. <laughs> um, so maybe this was an abandoned merchandising line. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, it. There's numerous times where the anonymity of G.I. Joe was super tested um, just by things like this. Like, there's super special action force uh, set of people, but, um, dude, they got credit cards with G.I. Joe written on it. It was very funny. Uh, issue number 59. So... Near the end of the issue, Cobra Commander says, knowing the location of the enemy is half of the victory. Almost certainly a sidelong reference to knowing is half the battle. Um, yeah, fantastic. Good use of uh, a good sort of uh, use of the comic, uh, the cartoons and and marrying them up and, and just creating a little bit of um, joy with that. Also in issue 59, we see that Raptor's car has a caution baby hawks on board sign in the rear window. Uh, love that as well. That's It's just the real show of force of comedy that we used to see in these comics. But it's, it's also definitely something that, uh, as a kid reading this, we wouldn't have sort of seen the, the funniness in that or the comedy in that. And in fact, I probably wouldn't have even read that as a kid. Um, would have just read the actual uh, panel writing and, and that's it, moved on. 
But yeah, very funny. Issue number 60. So uh, it's the only issue published during the original run with art by Todd McFarlane. Um, McFarlane and Larry Harmer disagreed on storytelling styles and he was soon let go and it was the first time he'd actually been fired from a book. <laughs> Very cool. In issue number 76, uh, so the reason that Ghost Rider is never called by name in, in this or any other issue of the comic um, is that Marvel Comics obviously already had the Ghost Rider character um, and they didn't want any confusion between uh, G.I. Joe and, and actual Marvel superheroes. So if you see Ghost Rider in G.I. Joe, they will just call him rando things, uh, rando references. They all mean him, but it's just a, um, just a nice, funny little reference to uh, we can't do this because of this. Yeah. Uh, issue number 77, Destro sunbathes with his helmet on. Uh, man, that's got to be hot. We all know it's a, a metal mask. So, yeah. Um, and I also want to mention as well, it wasn't really a cool fact because it's just part of the storyline. But, yeah, it's Rana and Lady J fighting in that uh, comic issue. was. It's worth going back and taking a look at. It's It's funny as... Uh, issue number 80. So it was the final issue advertised on television. Um, so the commercial aired around August of 1988, and it was noticeable, notable because it was the final Sunbow and Marvel collaboration. Uh, the cartoon did cease production with G.I. Joe the movie a year earlier, and the commercials were now done as well. So, yeah, this was the last issue. In issue number 93, uh, we finally get to see what Snake Eyes looks like. Thought that was pretty cool. In issue number 99, um, so we see some garbage get thrown at the feet of Spirit. Um, and then there's a close-up of his face that immediately follows. And it's clearly a reference to the famous crying Indian anti-pollution ads from the 70s. Um, I mean, I'm Australian and even I threw references in other forms of media um, know about that ad. So, yeah, cool little reference. Um, in issue 100... Clutch is wearing a Chaotix 1987 World Tour shirt. So apparently the Chaotix were a jam band that Larry Harmon was in. Uh, just, you know, it's things like this where you're actually learning about the guy writing the comics. Uh, very cool. In issue 103, and you can see it on the slide there, what is Roadblock doing? Uh, he's running around blind, being guided by a smaller man carried on his shoulders. So where have we seen that before? The G.I. Joe movie. Very funny. Very interesting. He's got Wild Bill on his back in, in the comic, but yeah, it's, and, you know, this is even more pertinent uh, at this point when we've got the Once a Man Cobra Commander getting released by Hasbro as well. Very cool. That's uh, maybe we need to um, get a few photos taken when the Dragonfly is released, or actually in hands, um, of Wild Bill on Roadblock's back would make for a very good reference to issue number 103. Uh, issue 108, and what a fantastic cover it's uh, definitely one of my favourites of all time of the G.I. Joe comic series line. Um, Stalker mentions those guys who battle supernatural slime uh, when they reach Columbia University. So Columbia's campus was used in early scenes of the Ghostbusters. It just wasn't named. 
Um, so what a nice little reference. And these guys know their stuff, uh, making their reference. We don't, like, once again, we don't have the internet to go and search cool things like this. They just knew. Uh, but, yeah, very interesting fact, I thought. Now, this, this I had no idea about this. And it, uh, I, I was super amazed by this because I didn't actually know that the universes were that, that uh, crossed. You know, they were all sitting in the same universe, apparently. But if you look on the slide down here, what does it say? It says that Metalhead's targeting reticule is made not by Mars, but by Stark Industries. Um, so they're saying they've got Iron Man in their universe. This, this was one of my favorite facts of doing this video. It, this blew my mind. Uh, in issue 120, the four red ninjas that Destro and Baroness fight are armed with a katana, a bow staff, a pair of size, and nunchucks. Where have we seen that before? It's the Ninja Turtles. They've just gone straight with the Ninja Turtles weapons. They've got four ninjas with the Ninja Turtle weapons. Uh, great little reference. Thought it was cool. Uh, okay. So in issue 131, we see vehicles racing out of the pit's shuttle ramp. Uh, they're actually crossfires. So they're rare vehicles from 1986. Um, if you haven't seen these before, because we don't really hear about them much in uh, the toy community, at least in Australia, we don't. Uh, the toys are radio controlled. So, um, and they were sold in two versions with different radio control frequencies. So we're seeing them in the comics, in this comic, they were radio controlled as well. So great little throwback to, uh, to those original toys. In issue 138, and another great cover, I'll, I'll add. Um, when Scarlet wakes from her nightmare, she recalls Hawk's words of a soldier's job is to do the unthinkable and be forgotten. And this is obviously the original version of Hawk's quote from issue number one. Uh, issue number 143. So this was the first issue not written by Larry Harmer since um, Stephen Grant's clutch centric fill-in way back in issue 20. Um, that would be 122 consecutive Harmer penned issues. 122 issues in a row that the guy wrote. Well done, bro. Well done. Um, and also, the story in issue 143 was actually written and drawn in 1982. Uh, it was intended as a fill-in issue if needed in the early days of the book. It actually sat unused for more than a decade for bo before being dusted off and giving a framing story set in more modern times. Um, and I absolutely love this. Uh, nobody wants any Joe story to go to waste. It's great that they reused it. Um, but yeah, go back and have a read of it and you'll just notice sort of older undertones of it. Uh, it was given a bit of a revamp, but yeah. And last up, um, so issue 155, it's where they wrapped up. Uh, I still don't own this issue. I, I need to get myself a copy. Um, but yeah, I found it interesting that who's in the background, Quick Kick. Um, so even though he was, he was killed in issue 109, he still managed to make it back just in time for the last issue. So, yeah, that's it. That's our uh, 50 sweet facts about the, the G.I. Joe original Real American Hero comic line. Um, like I said, let me know in the comments uh, if there are ones that were blatantly known by everyone on, on Earth except for me. 
um, or if there were a couple there that you didn't know about, uh, let me know. And if you enjoyed the con uh, content today, hit that like button. If you're not subbed, sub to my channel, please. Uh, I'm going to keep pumping out this, uh, what I think is cool content. Um, if there's anything that you'd like me to actually cover off in the history of G.I. Joe, let me know as well. Uh, more than happy just to do a little bit of research and, and give you what you want. Um, but apart from that, thanks so much for staying till the end. Um, and stay tuned for more sweet content from Frostbite's G.I. Joe Repro. See you later. Oh, 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 oh,